much. Nice to be here. I'm very proud to be uh, having Sweden represented uh, during this uh, exhibition by a pavilion. Um, hydrogen is an opportunity for fossil-free competitiveness, like my minister, Mr. Ibrahim Bailan, mentioned uh, on a video a while ago. And uh, fossil-free competitiveness is, of course, important to Swedish companies and also, naturally, for Korean companies. Uh, and we're happy to be here to talk about this and to have uh, with us uh, Dr. Gökce Mette to talk about uh, energy and industry transition. Uh, Dr. Mette is uh, head of the Secretariat for the Leadership Group for Green Transition, uh, for Industry Transition, which is hosted by uh, the Swedish uh, Environment uh, Institute, Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, Dr. Mette is also uh, co-founder of the Women in Green Hydrogen Network and uh, a research professional uh, for uh, 11 years in energy and industry transition. So please welcome Dr. Mette. Thanks a lot, Anders. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so do I use this for the slide? Yeah, yeah. next. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thanks a lot and uh, uh, thanks for the introduction. So I would like to talk a little bit about the uh, role of hydrogen in industry transition um, and would like to provide you with an international outlook. I represent the leadership group for industry transition. Um, this is a leadership group that brings together 16 governments from around the world, including South Korea and actually currently 19 companies with Salzgitter joining last week uh, from what we used to call harder to abate industries, but what we now call easier to innovate industries. Um, we have companies from steel, cement, chemicals, um, and heavy uh, duty transport sectors, among other industries. And these companies are countries collectively committed, they have committed to achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement and they convene under the belief that industry transition um, is possible only through public-private cooperation and partnership. Um, and actually within this group we have been tackling first and foremost steel and cement decarbonization issues around that. Because collectively, steel and cement are responsible for 15% of global emissions, and steel alone um, is responsible for 9% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and as it was presented uh, by POSCO today, we know the technologies, we now have the technologies to decarbonize steel, and it's true that it's recyclable, but there still needs to be a lot more work done. So within the leaded group, which is led by Sweden and India collectively, and supported by the World Economic Forum, uh, we have launched a green steel tracker. So we've been following green steel announcement and investments around the world. Among this list, you can also see POSCO. And, and we have found that of the seven largest uh, green steel uh, producing regions, there's at least one plant that, that aims towards production of green steel. Um, and when we looked at the technologies, we have seen that hydrogen, um, direct reduction of iron ore with hydrogen is the most prominent technology to date. And one such example is the hybrid project. Now, hybrid project is a partnership between uh, SSAB, LKAB, and Vattenfall. These companies are all leaded members. Today, they have succeeded in producing the world's first fossil-free steel, which they have sold to Volvo. Um, and this has been made possible um, for a variety of reasons, but the value of these offtake agreements has been fundamental. So, in Sweden, we have a 2045 um, 
target for climate neutrality. And as Minister Bailan uh, presented, Fossil Free Sweden carried out roadmaps with each sector. And because different sectors were aligned in the same goal, they all had the same pressure, they all have the same pressure to decarbonize. As Volvo cars have committed to have carbon neutral supply chains, and they need to procure green steel, um, they have signed this offtake agreement with hybrid, which makes the business case for production of green steel and other materials and products. Now in Germany, uh, Volkswagen has the same commitment and, and companies like ThyssenKrupp are also working towards green steel technologies to meet the supply and demand so that we have a business case. Um, and of course, hydrogen has other applications in industry transition. It can significantly reduce emissions in aluminium, in plastics, in um, cement and concrete industry. But it's crucial that we now focus on where it makes the most economic sense. And steel is certainly one of those sectors where hydrogen, um, targeted applications of hydrogen makes the most economic sense. And of course, um, within the leadership group for industry transition, we have come to conclusion that private sector can't do it alone. We certainly need public-private partnerships to address the green premium. These new production facilities processes are expensive. Um, so there's definitely a need to create a market. And this can be done through green public procurement. Um, it could be done through private buyers alliances. Um, but the focus should stay on scaling up hydrogen production. Another crucial part, and as we have seen also in the previous presentation, that steel um, and cement, uh, steel and hydrogen uh, are both highly traded products. So we need to have a clear understanding of how do we define these products and how do we trade them. So there's an urgent need for also working together in public-private partnership um, on certification schemes and facilitating cross-border trade. Of course, uh, efforts should be also underway um, for reducing the cost of electrolyzers. One such way to do that is to do it through industrial clusters. And I know in, in Korea, you already have a project RE100, um, the industrial city. So initiatives such as uh, RE100 are crucial for reducing the cost of industrial trans, uh, uh, transition and also cost of electrolyzers, because that creates economies of scale and the use of shared infrastructure. And many of the previous presenters mentioned that th there is now an, an accumulation of national targets and many countries are in a race um, to set and increase their ambition for hydrogen production and set ambitious targets. Um, and, and certainly the, the momentum for industry transition and hydrogen is growing. And when we look at the different targets, we, we are all seeing that there is a great, um, there's a great emphasis um, on, on increasing the use of hydrogen in industrial applications. Many of the project pipelines from different countries, including the UK hydrogen strategy and European hydrogen strategy, have targets to actually, in the European hydrogen strategy, uh, to completely scale off hydrogen production to decarbonize all harder to abate industries but we now call them easier to innovate industries, as I mentioned before. So I'd like to just go back to lead it and, and leadership group for industrial transition, um, in short, lead it and what we do within the group. Now, as I mentioned, public-private partnership will be crucial for making the business case. So we convene uh, with this best in class companies and most ambitious countries. Um, and we, we tackle some of the most important policy issues. I have mentioned green public procurement. So we are working towards establishing standards and, and setting ambitious targets so that governments can undersign or commit to 30% um, green public procurement commitment so that we create a demand for green steel, green cement, concrete, and other products and materials. We are also fostering private buyers clubs. Such clubs are emerging from around the world. So we need to make sure that, that companies across the value chain can cooperate, form buyers clubs, and sign off-take agreements. 
We're also tackling incentive schemes. Heavy industries will need subsidies and, and support from governments. Carbon contracts for difference is one such mechanism that is now being tested in the EU to, uh, to alleviate the, the risk of a volatile carbon price. And that could also play a role in fostering hydrogen economy. Um, of course, we are also um, discussing the difficult question of a future of carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Um, and, and how to also ensure that industrial, clust industrial clusters um, emerge, um, not only in, in the, the western part of the world or in the most advanced economies, but we can also cooperate on ensuring that industrial decarbonization is also accelerating in the developing world. We work with roadmaps. We believe that roadmaps are evidence-based and tried and tested strategy for industrial decarbonization. The experience from Sweden shows that if public and private sector can convene and, and create a roadmap together towards a set target, um, that could uh, really help achieve uh, milestones in technology and help, help industries reach tipping points. And hybrid is such example from Sweden. Um, so I'll stop here to be on time, but I'd like to take the opportunity to invite um, Korean companies to consider joining LEADIT. As I mentioned, Korea is a member of LEADIT, the Leadership Group for Industry Transition. So I'd be very pleased to be in touch with you and connect after the speeches and discuss 